music team and that truly is a wonderful array of songs. I can only think of a few words to describe what it's like to be gathered together at church as the church, as the people of God and one of them is joy, the other one is privilege and many more words we could use to describe what we experience here by God's grace as we gather together and so David the psalmist, didn't he? He said sometimes when he thinks of God, it's too much for him. It can be a little bit like that at times when we sing such truths. Alastair Begg, who many of you know, he's a Scottish man who lives in America, has lived in the United States for a long time. He's a wonderful preacher and he recounts one time he visited a church and they were getting ready to commence the service and they had a big countdown clock behind the pulpit and it counts down from 10, 9, 8, so on and so forth. And then when it gets to zero, the pastor runs up on the stage and says, are you ready to worship God now? All excited and Alastair Begg said, no, I just kicked the cat on the way here. I argued with my wife. I Things are hard for me during the week, you know, there's pressing trials. I'm not exactly ready to join your circus. And, um, you know, we do that, don't we? We come to church and we carry heavy trials at times. We swim through seasons where things are happening in our life. I'll never ever forget, and you've heard me say this many times, preach to broken hearts, as Spurgeon said, because in every pew you are sure to find them. And so we come carrying heavy trial, and yet simultaneously we come in possession of a supernatural joy. We are simultaneously burdened by the things of this world, our own sin, various trials, and the trials can be plethora. And yet we come knowing that we possess Christ and the joy that He gives us and the peace that He gives us. That's a simultaneous reality. Martin Luther spoke about another simultaneous reality. A little Latin phrase, don't let it switch your mind off when you hear it. It is simul et justice peccator, or simul justice et peccator, and that's Latin for simultaneously justified and yet sinners. At our justification, when we believe in Jesus by faith, we lay hold of the righteousness of Jesus. And so we are righteous, Luther said, but simultaneously we are also sinful. Simultaneously righteous in the sight of God and yet we still sin. I say all of that because embedded in our passage, it's really dawned on me, under the overarching purpose of the Gospel of John, which is what? The purpose of the Gospel of John, you remember, is so that one might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and having believed then have life in his name. Contained within the purpose of the Gospel of John, from John chapter 20, verse 31, is another simultaneous reality that we have been saved and we are being saved. We are justified and we're also being sanctified. And so under the purpose of the Gospel of John, which surely is the purpose of our of John chapter 9, which we're in, as you know. Under that purpose is another purpose, I believe. 
as to why God in his wisdom would give us this account of the man born blind who's been blind from birth and Jesus gives him sight. Well, as we journey along this morning, there'll be some other things that I want to unfold, but I just want to encourage you by saying that I think a major factor of this portion of Scripture is so that you and I would be reminded of the joy of our salvation. We lose the joy of our salvation because of what I mentioned at the very beginning. We face heartache and trial in various ways. We sin in a plethora of ways. David in Psalm 51, in verse 12, he longed for God. He says there in verse 12 of Psalm 51, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And he added this, And sustain me with a willing spirit. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and sustain me by a willing spirit. You and I need to face this life that we have that is filled with trial and filled with heartache and filled with our own sin. We need to face that with the reality of laying hold of the joy of our salvation. And if you're honest, and if I'm honest, too often in each 24-hour day that we are given by God's grace, we forget the joy of our salvation. And so in John 9... In verses 1 through 12, which will be again this morning, you will recall that there are five moving parts that I want us to consider. Last Lord's Day, we considered a theological question in verses 1 through 3. We touched on a top priority explained in verses 4 and 5. We'll consider a little bit more of that this morning and then we'll move into a touch of divinity in verses 6 and 7, and then lastly, we'll see as we close out the first 12 verses of John 9, we'll see a transformation so shocking. That's the outline, a theological question, a top priority explained, a touch of divinity, and a transformation so shocking. But if you haven't already, I want to invite you to turn with me to John chapter 9, and let's just read these first 12 verses again together. There's more that occurs in this encounter, but we're isolating ourselves to the first 12 verses. Verse 1 of John 9, follow along with me in your Bibles as I read. As he, that's Jesus, passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. Not a man who became blind, but a man who was born blind. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but... It was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Verse 5, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground. And he made clay of the spittle and applied the clay to his eyes and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam which is translated sent. So he went away and washed and came back seeing. Therefore, the neighbors and those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, is not this the one who used to sit and beg? Others were saying, this is he. Still others were saying, no, but he is like him. And he kept saying, I am the one. So they were saying to him, how then were your eyes opened? He answered, The man who is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went away and washed and I received sight. They said to him, where is he? 
He said, I do not know. I do not know. Last Lord's Day, if you were with us, if you weren't, I want to encourage you to catch that message online. But last Lord's Day, I made mention of what other commentators have made mention of, the various contrasts between John chapter 8 and John chapter 9. I'm not going to repeat all those now, but they are quite significant. They are uh, interesting to observe. And one of those is the idea that the religious leaders in verse 59 of John chapter 8 were seeking to pick up stones and kill Jesus. And now here in John chapter 9, Jesus kneels down to pick up not stones, but mud, not to kill, but to heal. And one of the things I made mention of last Lord's Day is in John chapter 8, Jesus is the light of the world who can see what we cannot see, namely those who profess to believe in Jesus, but are altogether false. But in John chapter 9, Jesus serves as the light of the world by granting sight to his people, those that he's calling out of the world and saving in John chapter 8, there were those who were running around with eyes to see all that's going on around them, but they were spiritually blind. But here lie a man who cannot see at all, who didn't have eyes to see, who now sees, who now sees. Jesus came down, sent from the Father, to help those who are aware of their greatest need, not those who see no need for help. In the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says there, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Interestingly enough, the word poor comes from the word to beg. To beg. To be so innately bankrupt and unable to draw down from your own spiritual resources that you finally acknowledge that you need the resources of another. Blessed are those who beg for spiritual help. They will be given eyes to see. That's why we always say about the church, don't we? That the church is not a place for the righteous and the holy. That's how the world views us. We come in neatly dressed and smile and yes sir, no ma'am, no cussing and the like. And people think we are holier than thou, but the exact opposite is true, isn't it? We are those who realize we are sinful. We are those who realize we need help. Therefore, we must be those who ever rejoice and find joy in the help that we got. We received great help. Did we not? We know from the beginning here, the disciples ask a theological question. They were pointing out the person's sin. They weren't qualifying at all, just simply asking, whose sin was it? His or his parents? Jesus says it was neither. It has as its purpose the works and glory of God. And you remember... In verse 4, Jesus immediately says, We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. In verse 3, Jesus had mentioned the works of God to help answer the disciples' question, to teach them a thing or two about who sinned or who didn't sin. And then he says in verse 4, So as to also teach them something, that we must be about the works of of God. The twelve stood back and all they thought about was the sin in the life of the beggar. Do you remember Jesus leans forward, focused on God receiving glory through the doing of God's will and God's work? Jesus, over and over through this gospel, is explained as being the one who is sent by the Father. John chapter 3 tells us, in fact, that God is a God who has sent the Son to do His will. And by the way, in verse 4, some of your Bibles may say, I must work the works of Him who sent me. That's just incorrect. We must work the works of Him who sent me, Jesus is saying. He's using the royal we to include not only Himself, but His disciples and all of us. 
The idea there that Jesus runs to under that heading we looked at last week, a top priority explained, is Jesus saying to the disciples, don't be about standing there wondering about what sin caused what suffering in the life of certain people. Instead, be focused about doing the works of God. We need to be less about looking at the sin in others and more focused about bringing glory to God. Jesus was sent, and he's saying here, by using that royal we, so are you. So are you and I. Do you know that in John chapter 17, verse 18, when Jesus prays to his Father, our Father, he says this, As you, Father, sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. We've been sent to do something. Jesus is saying to the disciples and saying to you and I, don't just sit around asking questions about what is going on around you. Actually, get in there and do something about what's going on around you. Actually, use your gifts. Jesus is drawing the focus in the life of the disciples off the wrong things and trying to focus it on the right things. Use your gifts and in the using of your gifts that God has given you will be the glory of God. I would even go so far to say that Jesus is reminding them in the context of suffering. Yes, suffering exists. Yes, my dear disciples, you cannot equate suffering with a one-to-one correlation, having as its cause the sin in the life of a person or even your life. But instead, you need to be about keeping focused on using your gifts. And as you use your gifts, as you focus on doing the will of God, God's glory will be displayed. And get this. The purpose of your own suffering will be revealed and you will therefore then be able to rest in it and not lose the joy of your salvation. Let's keep moving now into the next part of what's going on here. And that is number three, a touch of divinity. Headings one and two were last Lord's Day. Now heading number three. A touch of divinity as this continues on in verses 6 through 7. Look at verses 6 and 7 with me. When he, that's Jesus, had said this, that is when he had explained to them the proper fitting manner to live and that he is the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay from the spittle. It's here now we read of Jesus actually curing this man of his blindness, which he was born with. I want you to notice from the very beginning of this entire encounter, when Jesus passed by, it says in verse 1, till this very action here of spitting on the ground, through to putting the clay on the man's eyes, and then all that comes afterwards... I want you to notice that it's Jesus who has taken the initiative. It's Jesus who has taken the initiative. Not only is this sign performed by Jesus, as I made mention of last week, a work of God to signify that Jesus alone, who as the light of the world gives spiritual sight to lost sinners. This encounter here between Jesus and the man born blind also teaches us about the gospel. The gospel. Contained within the gospel is the joy of our salvation. So this passage here will teach us not only that Jesus is the one who gives spiritual sight to lost sinners, but it will teach us about the gospel. What do I mean? Well, humanity is spiritually blind, born spiritually blind into this world. You and I were 
born spiritually blind into this world and you and I were completely unable to remedy that spiritual blindness. There aren't many people, there are no people on earth who are blind who can remedy their own blindness. Growing up I remember a man who was considered a considerable hero. His name was Fred Hollows. You would know the name Fred Hollows because he was born in Dunedin. He was born in Dunedin, but he lived in Australia his, most of his life, and he was pivotal in restoring the eyesight to countless people around the world who had what is called avoidable blindness. Estimations are that over one million people received healing to their avoidable blindness due to Fred and his work. I can remember growing up and seeing Fred in Africa, Fred in all sorts of countries. The Fred Hollows Foundation continues on to this day and Fred was marked by a very simple phrase. Fred got things done. It's even on the Fred Hollows website. That's his catch cry about Fred. Fred got things done. You see, Fred and his team, they went out and they worked because unless they went out to the communities and to the countries and worked on those eyes, the people would not be cured. Well, the same is said for us. Unless Jesus came and did his work of grace in us, giving us spiritual sight, remedying our malady, we would just be in a spiritually blind sight. We would be like the world all around us who are very much alive physically but who are blind spiritually. Jesus has come down having been sent from God the Father to us and praise God that from out of His love having endured such hostility, having shed His own blood for us on the cross, having been faithful to the Father, Jesus grants to us by the work of the Spirit both a new heart with spiritual eyes to see spiritual truth. And so first, Jesus has come to the blind sinner and now what we've just read in verses 6 and 7, Jesus now does a work in that sinner. And that's illustrated for us, oddly enough, as our Lord spits on the ground. You think that's odd? I do. It's really odd. I mean, when you read it, it's bizarre. Jesus spat on the ground. And then with the moisture that's on the ground, he picks up his own spit and he begins to knead the dirt into clay. By the way, if you're reading ahead, and I trust you always are, you'll see in just a few verses after verse 12 that Jesus performs this on the Sabbath and they want to go after him on the Sabbath. Do you know why they, they say he broke the Sabbath? Because he was kneading on the Sabbath. You're not allowed to knead on the Sabbath. But so Jesus spits on the ground, he mixes it up in his hands, and then he applies it to the eyes of this man born blind. Now this is unique and kind of odd, right? Why would Jesus spit on the ground and then proceed to make clay out of that damp dirt and then put this muddy clay on the man's eyes. Why? Well, one thing I learned was that there's a phrase that we use, such and such is a spitting image of his father. Now some people say, no, no, I mean it's splitting. Now I looked it up, it's actually spitting. Such and such is a spitting image of his father or mother or so on and so forth. You know where that phrase came from? That phrase came from the idea of old that in saliva, 
there was inherent power and properties passed on. Interesting, eh? But anyway, when you think about this event here, Jesus didn't ever really do anything like that at other times, did he? Other times he kind of just healed with a word. Other times he would cast out a demon, so on and so forth. But not ever really like this. Not ever really like this. And so there's a few things that we can consider here about why Jesus has done what he's done. First, it's to bring sight to the blind and that was the mark of the Son of God, Jesus the Messiah. To give sight to the blind was a mark of the Messiah. I want you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 4 and we're going to surf through from there back to the New Testament. Exodus chapter 4. And look at verse 11. Well, let's read verse 10. Then Moses said to Yahweh, Please, Lord, I've never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Yahweh said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? It is not, is it not I, Yahweh? Yahweh does that. Go to Psalm 146, verse 10. Oh, sorry. Psalm 146, verse 8. Yahweh opens the eyes of the blind. He opens the eyes of the blind. Keep going now and go to Isaiah 29. And look at verse 18. On that day, the deaf will hear words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. Flick ahead to chapter 35 of Isaiah. And look at verse 4. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come. He will save you. Verse 5. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. Go to chapter 42. Yahweh speaking, Isaiah 42, look at verse 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. This is talking about the Lord Jesus. This is the Father speaking of the eternal Son. He will bring forth justice to the nations... 
He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlines will wait expectantly for his law. Look at verse 6. I am Yahweh, I have called you, talking to the Son, I have called you, Son, in righteousness. I will also hold you, Son, by the hand and watch over you, Son. And I will appoint you, Son, as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, and Son, to open the eyes of the blind, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. I am Yahweh, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another. Because my glory will all be given to my son. And so the first reason Jesus did what he did here by giving sight to the blind was to evidence that Yahweh has sent him as Messiah. The second is, the second reason Jesus grabbed the dirt and made clay and put it on the eyes, really is to parallel the work of creation. To parallel the work of creation back in Genesis, you recall, when God made man from the ground, from clay. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 says, God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Sometimes we think in a very simplistic way of God as creator. And then Jesus as the one who died on the cross, which he did. But sometimes we divorce the two in our mind. We kind of have God, creator, and then Jesus, atoner. But Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 says, For by Jesus all things were created in heaven and on earth. Jesus made the world. Jesus was and is the creator God. Jesus took man and made him from the clay of the ground. And here he is now, Jesus, doing a work of creation, recreation upon the eyes of a man who has never seen. And when I think of this, I think, praise God that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is also the all-powerful, all-creator and sustainer of the entire universe. It's such a blessing, it's such a comfort, and such an immense truth that the Lord who, by the way, loved you and gave himself upon the cross for you, what a joy it is that he is the one who has done a healing work upon your spiritual faculties. What a joy that he is the one who has the power to not only recreate you spiritually, but because He's the creator of the entire universe and who is the one who sustains the entire universe, is also able to sustain you spiritually and to keep you from stumbling. Your salvation is something greatly to rejoice in. But if you simply just rejoice in the fact that our sins have been forgiven and all these kind of things, we're just worshipping and adoring the benefits. We must rise beyond the benefits and worship the benefactor, the one who gives us these immense gifts. It is a blessing and a comfort to know that we will be sustained spiritually, that we worship and adore not some feigned, bogus deity and lord, but we worship and adore and serve and are loved by the living God who delights to grant us life upon life and grace upon grace. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. And place in me or sustain me by a willing spirit. Third, I believe there's another aspect to why Jesus did what he did here. And John Calvin was the first to write of this, and I agree with him. What Jesus did, what he did with the clay on the eyes, was to make the matter worse. To make it 
worse, to double the malady, to increase the matter so as to magnify the healing. Sometimes Jesus works like that. He makes things worse so as to magnify His power and His grace. He makes us weak so that His power might be displayed. He brings us low so that He might be made high and glorified. And so that's three reasons why I believe Jesus did what He did. But there's one more thing I want to say here. When we think of all the people who encountered Jesus as we read about them, and Jesus performed a work of grace in them, He never did so the same way. Have you noticed that before? He never did it the same way. He never repeated himself in these works of grace that he did in his earthly ministry. In fact, if we were able to just line up all the people that we read about in the New Testament, and there's lots of them, and we would ask them, how does Jesus restore an individual? You could have them all lined up and they'd all give different answers, wouldn't they? Some would say this, some would say that. In fact, oddly enough, in Mark chapter 7, there's another person who was blind and Jesus healed them. They were the one that saw everything upside down for a little while, the trees upside down. I read an account this week of a Scottish, again, a Scottish pastor making comment about Imagining the conversation between this man born blind and that man in Mark 7 who was healed. Jesus didn't do any of this clay on him. He just said he healed. He, he, did, he did strange things, didn't he? Also with people who couldn't hear, he stuck his fingers in their ears and so on and so forth. But with these two men who now see, this Scottish preacher imagine a conversation between the two and they begin to debate about how it is that Jesus gives sight to people. One says, well, no, Jesus just said a word and I could see. And the other said, no, 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 no. In order to see, he has to put mud on your eyes. The other guy says, no mud. No, no, we have to have clay. The other guy says, no, no, there's no clay. And the preacher made a joke about that was the beginning of two denominations, the Muddites and the anti-Muddites. But Jesus dealt with all these people differently, didn't he? They'd each give a different report if they were here today. But I think there's something encouraging for us here. And it's this. We can draw from that that Jesus deals with each of us very differently. Very differently. Yes, He is the same Savior, He's the same divine essence, He atones for the sins of His people, and yet how He reaches us is different. Yes, it's the same gospel that saves us, but the manner in which He attends to us is very different. And what I love about that is that I know my Savior knows me and loves me. And that's not selfish to say that. That actually restores to me the joy of His salvation that He grants me because I know that He came to me. He passed by me. He loves me. And the way He deals with me is different to the way He deals with you. But it's the same kind shepherd. And not only does He deal with us when He first comes to us into justification... But he also deals with us each individually on our path of sanctification. I like that. But moving on, Jesus says to him now in verse 7, 
under this heading still of a touch of divinity. Look there in verse 7. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Jesus puts the eyes, the, the clay on the eyes and then says to him, go. And the man obeys. Mark that down. The man obeys. He is obedient. He goes to the pool. And I want to tell you a little bit about the pool. The pool was a fair way away. It was, it was several miles away. And so this man had to walk. Not sure he, maybe he's ever walked there before. He's got mud on his eyes. He can't see. He's probably seeking help, maybe stumbling and tripping. But he is obeying. He's obeying. And I want you to know what John wants us to know. He wants us to know that this pool of Siloam means sent. Look there. You can't skip by that. He, he, John wants us to know that the meaning of that pool is sent. He doesn't want us to skip by that. Why? Well... Back in Isaiah 8, we actually read about this pool. This pool was given its name back in Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 15. But this pool, if you remember from John 8, when we went through the Feast of Booths and that festival, each day of that, well, there was eight days of the Feast of Booths and seven days, the priests would go out from the temple and they would go through what's called the water gate. You can read about that in Nehemiah. And they would go to the pool of Siloam and they would collect water and they would bring it back. And you remember at the Feast of Booths, they would hold up that water and pour it out. And the people would scream, show us the water. And you remember on that eighth day when there was no water, that's when Jesus stood up and said, if anyone's thirsty, if anyone needs water. There's no water here, but there's water right here, he said. If anyone needs water, let them come to me and drink. Well... The Feast of Booths, which has just occurred, was to commemorate the presence and the providence of God, right? That's why they celebrated. Out in the wilderness, God provided for them. God was with them. And so the Feast of Booths was to celebrate the presence and providence of God. Well, Jesus, as the one sent from the Father, he stands and proclaims, as I said, in that Feast of Booths, that he is the water that gives life. And this pool, which is translated scent, Siloam, it received its water from water being sent from a large spring called Gihon. And so Jesus sends this man to a pool that is there to symbolize the very blessing of God. And so follow with me here. The sent one of God sends this man to the pool, which means sent, for it symbolizes the blessing and presence and providence of God. He sends him there. And remarkably, in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 6, we read of the people of Israel rejecting the waters of Siloam. The scent water. And remarkably, here in John 8 and John 9, the people of Israel are rejecting the Son of God, the Lord Jesus, the scent water of God. And so all through this, and even into the sending of this man to a pool called scent, are strong self salvific Strong salvation tones here in our passage. Jesus recreates these, this man's eyes. He sends him, sends him to the pool to wash the clay off his eyes. And then look at the end of verse 7. Look there. He came back seeing. He came back seeing. He can see because of the help of the sent one from God. 
And this man has his eyes recreated. And I trust you can see the gospel here. With the love and help of the sent one from God. You and I have had our spiritual eyes and our hearts recreated. And we have bathed in the pool of Siloam. The Lord Jesus. Jesus comes by. He initiates our spiritual recreation. He then does a work in us. We then respond in faith. And that faith ensures that we lay hold of spiritual sight. And all is a gift from God to us in the person of Jesus who is the sent one from God. Our, our hearts cry in response to all of that. When we think about how lost and how blind we were, we were spiritually stuck in the mud, if you will, unable to see a thing or do a thing. Surely our response to that must be something like, how can it be? How can it be that me, such a vile, wretched sinner, receive such immense Grace, how can it be that God showed mercy to me and gave me, out of all people, most undeserving to be able to be on the receiving end of such mercy and love, why would God give me sight to see the truth and for me to believe the gospel and therefore then to live true life? How can it be? There's a hymn about that, isn't there? And can it be? And can it be that I should gain? Just a blind lost beggar on the side of the road, outside the temple of God, excluded from God, a sinner altogether unclean. How can it be that I should gain my sight? You know the words of this hymn, we sing it. He left his father's throne above, he was sent. So free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all immense and free, for oh my God, it found out me. I was on the side of the road blind. And the love of God incarnate, the Lord Jesus Christ, passed by me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. And place in me a willing spirit. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, blind, unable to change myself, do anything about that, Fast bound in sin and nature's night, thine eye, your eye, diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light, my chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, I went forth, and I followed thee. He told me to go to the pool of Siloam, and I went. You know the rest. No condemnation. Now I dread. Jesus and all in Him is mine. Alive in Him my living head. And clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne. And claim the crown through Christ my own. It's a touch of divinity. It's a touch of love. It's worthy of joy. Very quickly. Finally, there's a transformation that occurs that is so shocking. A transformation so shocking. From verse 8 through 12, you, you read that. The neighbors who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, look at this. 
Is not this the one who used to sit and beg? I love what one commentator drew out here. That phrase, used to, that's a powerful word. Do you know what? You used to do things that you don't do anymore. And our brother up there, he used to do that, but he doesn't do it anymore. And our sister over there, she used to be marked by that, but she doesn't do it anymore. There has been a transformation that has occurred in her life. She doesn't live a perfect life. He doesn't live a perfect life. We don't live a perfect life. We are simultaneously justified and yet sinners, but there is a transformation that has taken place in our life because of Jesus Christ. This man could now see, and you can imagine, he would have spent a lot of time running around town looking at the walls that he'd never seen, looking at the lanes he'd never seen, looking at flowers he'd never seen, looking people in the face that he'd never seen before. And all that gave him great joy. And I want to ask you a question. In the midst of all the pressures that you face, and in, I'm saying this to myself too, in the midst of all the trials and the heartaches that we face, have you and I lost our joy in Jesus? Have the problems of the world crowded our heart that we have eclipsed the beloved son in our heart? You may not have all that you want on earth, but you can see. You can see. What can you see? You can see the truth in a world full of lies. And your soul, which will live long after the possessions of this world have fallen apart, your soul has peace with God. You can see God in the person of Jesus Christ. One day you will be in heaven where there will not be any worry or any want or any need. It'll all be gone because the eyes that you have been given that have been made new will look full in the face of the one who loved you and endured the agony for you and purchased life for you, eternal life, your salvation. I don't like the pain in this world. And you don't like the pain in this world. I don't like the pressure in this world. I don't like the trials of this world. But I know that this will all end and will be with Jesus. I am just like you. I am a sinful man who has been justified and declared righteous and holy by a merciful God. We are richer here on earth than the richest man alive. Elon Musk has all the toys and all the money and he lacks no earthly thing. But unless Jesus takes the initiative, unless he passes by and comes by his house, if you will, he will die as a man born blind, unable to see and unable to stop the judgment of God. And that goes for anyone here this morning who has not yet received the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter your age. You may not have all that you need or even all that you want right now, but rejoice in what you do have, the life of Christ, the mind of Christ, the eyes of Christ, for you are united to Christ. Seek first His kingdom, and then if it be His will, as you seek first His kingdom and rejoice in your salvation and regard highly the Son whom the Father regards highly, then possibly earthly provision will be added unto you. This is the gospel right here. This is what God wants you and I to hear today. He wants us to rejoice in the salvation that has come to us by Him. And He wants us to obey Him and follow Him and find satisfaction in His Son. And look at verse 11. The man who is called Jesus made clay. That's what the, man, that's what the blind man who can now see said. He's speaking about Jesus now. The joy of his salvation overflows into him wanting to speak about the one who has granted him salvation. A transformed life so shocking that this man was not recognizable as he was obedient to what Christ commanded of him. You know what the Puritans used to say of this man? The Puritans would say of this man that this man right here, he obeyed Christ blindly. He got he couldn't see, he had mud put on his eyes, 
And Jesus said, go, and he went. He obeyed Christ blindly. And the result of his blind obedience to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was a joy. And we'll see later on in this chapter, it is a remarkable, remarkable salvation. We don't need a countdown clock and some circus show to get us ready to worship God and ignore all our pains and sorrows. We need the truth of the word of God by the spirit of God fixated and focused on the son of God to simultaneously have joy in our heartache and our suffering. May God give us hearts to do the works of him who sent not only his beloved son, but who sent us as well. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and thank you once again for this opportunity. Lord, tomorrow will come, if it's your will, and we will be faced with the trials and pressures that are ours. Lord, your disciples on this day queried what sin was the cause of suffering. We know sin brings about suffering, but Lord, we know that you, you have ordained things for our life and we're so prone to seeking joy in that which never gives lasting joy. Lord, alter our perspective now. Help us to adore the light of the world, the Lord Jesus. Thank you for this account. Lord, help us to confess sin and live consistent with our confession of Jesus as Lord of our life. Thank you that you sent your son to pass by us and that he showed initiative in saving us. Lord, we can't find joy in our own strength but we trust by faith that when your son says he gives us joy and peace that we can lay hold of that and so help us as your children to lay hold of this peace and joy for anyone here who has not yet come to know the Lord Jesus who doesn't do the works of God who hasn't yet experience that quickening ray from the light of the world would would this moment be the day regardless of their age that they say in their heart Jesus I am a great sinner but you are a greater savior and I lay hold of all that you are by trusting you now that you died for my sins and that you rose again Lord that is not a message that we must ever forget, but lay at our hearts each and every day. Help us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.